Hello and welcome to our live stream on mental health after 50. I'm Ed Bottomley with the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication. Today, we are going to be talking about mental health concerns that people may have as they grow older and how they and their loved ones can recognize and get help for these concerns. This is the first of four live streams on mental health topics that we'll be doing as part of Mental Health Month. Today's panelists include three faculty from our Department of Psychiatry, all with special ex expertise in the mental health of older adults. Two are geriatric psychiatrists, Dr. Lauren Gerlach and Dr. Donovan Maust. Dr. Gerlach sees patients at our geriatric psychiatry clinic, and Dr. Maust sees patients at the VA Ann Arbor Health System. Both have special expertise in the use of medications to address mental health and behavioral issue, issues in older adults. And one, Dr. Amanda Leggett, is a researcher who has focused much of her work on the caregivers who provide support and care for older adults, including those with mental health conditions and behavioral issues related to dementia. All three of these experts are also members of the Eisenberg Family Depression Center here at the University of Michigan, and they are all members of the UM Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. You can submit questions at any time for our panel to answer during the Q&A portion of today's chat. Questions can be submitted by commenting on this video, but please note that your name, or your profile name will be visible to others participating. If you prefer a more anonymous option, you can send a private message to us, or you can email us at ask-mishmed at med.umich.edu. That was a little bit of a mouthful. So one more time, ask-mishmed at med.umich.edu. Now, one more thing, if you can't stay for the whole chat, or if you want to share the recording with a friend, a video of the chat in its entirety will be available on our Michigan Medicine YouTube channel. So let's kick things off with some questions. First, I'd like to ask each of you to start off by simply stating what you think people over 50 may not know about mental health as they age, but need to know. And let's start with Dr. Maust. Thanks for the question, Ed. Uh, so one thing, uh, maybe the people over 50 know, but uh, the learners that I work with might not know is when I work with students or residents, uh, I like to make sure they know that getting older is not depressing. So in fact, in research where they've looked at the past year um, prevalence or rates of depression, um, the lowest rates are among older adults. Uh, so I just, I, I think because of the ageism we have in our society, I like to make sure folks that I work with know uh, that it's not depressing to get old. And in fact, older adults usually are really doing very well. Thank you. And I see the nods from our two other panelists from, from that. I'll, I'll pass to you now, Dr. Gerlach. Yes, I absolutely agree. I think there's a common myth that as we get older, we're more likely to experience mental health concerns. And that's not the case. Actually, a recent poll that we did of over 2,000 older adults um, through Michigan Medicine and through partnership with AAR AARP found that older adults, about 80%, find that their mental health is as good, if not better, than it was 20 years ago. Um, that being said, many pe people may have experienced some uh, symptoms like depression or anxiety, and there are very hel uh, helpful uh, treatments available for folks to get them feeling better if needed. Thank you. Dr. Leggett? Yeah, I think I'll jump in and kind of reiterate what my colleagues have been sharing. I think it is inevitable that there are losses that can be experienced with aging, whether loss of peers or loved ones or even decline in physical capabilities. However, older adults are generally really resilient to these changes. And I think one thing that I would want all older adults to know is that it's important to recognize that it's possible to adapt and adjust to some of these changes and really be resilient in the face of loss. So finding ways to continue to participate in activities or things that you enjoy um, in spite of some of these losses that can come with age is important and 100% possible. Thank you. Thank you all three for that. The next question that we have up 
This is Mental Health Month, which is supposed to help raise awareness of issues that in the past weren't really talked about. People over 50 or so grew up in a time when having a mental health condition was highly stigmatized and not talked about. For much of their lives, we also didn't have the kinds of treatments and focus on early diagnosis that we have today. Does this make it harder for older adults to recognize or perhaps seek help for these issues? And I'll pass to uh, you first, Dr. Gallup. Sure. So I think that while we know that uh, adults and older adults uh, as well are getting more comfortable discussing mental health and that we know that kind of general attitudes toward treatment are more favorable, there still is some stigma that exists. And I think that can make it difficult for folks to feel comfortable talking about symptoms like depression, anxiety, struggles that folks might be going to or seeking out services. Um, however, you know, I think there are a lot of misperceptions about mental health treatment that are important to address. Many people have concerns that if they start a medication like an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication, um, that it might change their personality or they'll become dependent on the medication, um, or they are concerned that talking about these things are a personal failing or that they're weak. And that's very much not the case. And so I think there's been more awareness, you know, certainly during the COVID pandemic about the importance of mental health is a key pillar of physical health, um, but I do think that can make it difficult for some folks to, to seek treatment. Thanks. I see you nodding to that as well, Dr. Leggett. Is there anything to add? Yeah, I think I would also share that, and I, I'm sure we'll talk more about this today, but many times mental health um, symptoms or challenges kind of co-occur with um, other common things that older adults might experience, whether it be chronic illness or physical decline or even sleep problems. And so I think when we think about mental health, it's a very important piece of this broader um, umbrella of health. And so I think kind of going along with the stigma that's been described, I think it's important that we recognize that mental health is health and, you know, addressing mental health can help improve physical health and, and vice versa. So I, I see that a lot with sleep. I think um, there's an under recognition of, of how important, for example, sleep is to mental health and, and vice versa. So improving in one can help with improvements in the other and improve just health overall. Thank you. And, and finally, Dr. Maust, anything to add on this question? Maybe the only thing uh, I might add is that I think uh, sometimes older adults um, can perhaps enjoy a special status or role in their family and in their extended family, which I think um, can be one of those things that makes it perhaps particularly difficult, uh, um, concerned that uh, expressing mental health need might be perceived as a sign of weakness. Um, and so again, I think echoing what Drs. Gerlach and Leggett said, um, this idea that mental health is just really a part of health and, you know, in the way that you'd want somebody to have their blood pressure addressed or their diabetes addressed, um, th that's, that's the way that you should look at a mental health concern as well as it's just you taking care of yourself so you can then take care of your family. Thank you. Thank you for that. The next question that we're going to move on to, what are some common risk factors for mental health concerns that are unique to older adults. For example, social, is social isolation can put you more at risk for depression. And this has been of concern for older adults during the pandemic. Dr. Leggett, I see you nodding to that one. Oh, and you've unmuted, go for it, Dr. Mass. Oh. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay, yeah, sure, I'm happy to jump in there. So some of these are not necessarily unique to older adults, but maybe more common for older adults. And some of them I just mentioned, or we just mentioned in, in the last question, but things like sleep um, problems, chronic illness and disability, um, bereavement, that can be more common, for example, um, for older adults, um, having had a prior depressive episode at some earlier point in one's life. Um, and then close to my heart is caregiving Giving stress. Um, oftentimes, older adults are involved in caregiving roles, and when those roles can become in increasingly stressful, that can relate to uh, mental health as well. 
Yeah, and picking up where Dr. Leggett left off or, around role change or, or role um, changes in function, sometimes older adults might be nearing the point of retirement. And so for people who maybe kind of define their role and a lot of their life around the work that they did, uh, that can be a real loss that they experience. Um, uh, additionally, I think there can be um, uh, pain, increasing burden of pain we know uh, is, is linked in insomnia. Um, um, in, in addition to some changes in your close relationships uh, where people are moving, um, your close friends might say ha be having their own um, illnesses. So it can just be a period of a lot of change and transition for people. Thanks. Let's move on to our next question. What preventative measures could people over 50 take to be more proactive about their mental health? Sure, I guess I can start off. I, one thing that we often say is what's good for your heart is also good for your brain, meaning that kind of having a routine where we're getting good sleep and regular sleep, we're exercising, we're watching our diet, we're socializing, spending time with people who are important to us, doing things that are meaningful, give us joy and give us purpose. That type of structure and activity is really good in kind of maintaining kind of those social connections as well as maintaining um, mental health. Uh, so those are some of the routines that I often will talk with patients about starting. I sometimes uh, encourage activity um, in three areas, uh, physical activity, social activity, and intellectual activity as kind of an umbrella way to, th to think about um, kind of prevention and maintaining function as well as you can in, in all areas of life. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, the next question that we have up, even though people may not realize it, a lot of older adults are indeed seeing therapists or taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication or getting treatments. Do you have any statistics about this that you can share with us? Sure. So I would first off saying receiving mental health treatment is common. So about one in five older adults, about 20% are taking some type of psychiatric medication, whether that's for depression, anxiety, or other mental health conditions. Um, unfortunately, counseling individual therapy sometimes can be a scarce resource. Uh, the best estimates that I could see for older adults is that somewhere from six to 10% are seeing an individual counselor or therapist. I think with the pandemic, one positive aspect to come out is kind of a, a real growth in kind of telehealth and remote services, which have really opened up options for folks who maybe were geographically too distant. Um, but those are roughly the statistics we quote. Thank you for that. The, the next question that we have, and I'll, I'll push this to you as well, Dr. Gerlach, the pandemic has been a huge strain on the mental health of just about everyone. Are older people experiencing this more intensely or are they proving more resilient than younger people? And Dr. Gerlach, I believe you were actually involved in a poll that was conducted on this topic. Sure. So in partnership with AARP and Michigan Medicine, we conducted a survey through the University of Michigan National Poll on Healthy Aging to survey older adults or adults age 50 to 80 about the impact of the pandemic on their mental health. Um, we heard from over 2000 respondents across the country. And actually of our respondents, most reported that their mental health was actually no worse um, than before the pandemic. And actually older adults were faring better than young younger cohorts. Um, and there's some thoughts about why that might be. So resiliency, wisdom, kind of an ability to kind of put this current situation in perspective and in context of an entire life history. Um, I think like Dr. Leggett was saying earl earlier, there's really a lot of resiliency and strength that, that older adults can pull on. We did find that certain populations were at higher risk of developing worse mental health symptoms during the pandemic. In particular, our uh, female respondents reported worse mental health symptoms. And I think Dr. Moss was mentioning as well too, um, also patients who had worse physical health also reported noticing worse mental health symptoms as well too. So those were two populations that, that did mention worse symptoms. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Leggett, you have a special interest in caregivers as a population, spouses, adult children, and others who help support older people they live with, or from a distance as they navigate life with a chronic disease or disability. What has the pandemic been like for them? And what special mental health concerns do caregivers need to be watching for in themselves? Definitely. I've been involved in some research on this over the past couple of years and um, interviewed over 100 um, dementia caregivers and also even interviewed some family members who took on caregiving roles related to COVID. So that's a whole new type of caregiving that we've been studying as well. And I like to use the uh, Dickens quote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, because I think some really fantastic things have come out of the pandemic, but of course, course, it's also been a really challenging time for caregivers. But if we want to think about the positives, maybe for a minute, for many caregivers, um, the, the pandemic increased their ability to be at home with their care recipient and have more special time together at home, as opposed to maybe being away at work or other responsibilities that take them away from the person for whom they're providing care. I think as was mentioned, it's really increased our access to telehealth and even virtual programming uh, that individuals can enjoy and not having to leave the house, which can sometimes be challenging, especially um, for individuals living with dementia. And so being able to access that care from home has been a great benefit. Um, being able to set or establish one's routine really as desired has been a really positive thing that some of the caregivers I've spoken with have noted. But then of course, for other there's been aspects that have been really challenging. So uh, particularly, I would say those who've been using services like adult day service programs or support groups or even in-home nursing services. And many of these services were interrupted, especially in the early, um, the first year of the pandemic. And so that was a major challenge where maybe caregivers were receiving assistance outside of the home or in the home, and all of a sudden that wasn't there. So put a lot more burden on their shoulders and even medical care. So accessing medical care, even um, though we did gain um, in a lot of ways with telehealth, probably for our older um populations, it was a little bit more of a challenging adjustment for them. And some of our caregivers would talk about how it was difficult to share physical concerns over a screen when they really felt like a doctor should be seeing them in person. And then for caregivers in particular, oftentimes they were limited from attending appointments because health centers were limiting the number of individuals who could be in a room at any given time. And so caregivers often felt unsure about um, what the directions were when the care recipient would come home and things like that. So those have been some of the big challenges. Uh, and then, I mean, honestly, it's it's kind of sad to hear this, but many caregivers have even said to me, finally, people are now realizing the isolation that I've been experiencing as a caregiver for years. So some caregivers who had already been living somewhat of a, a lifestyle where they were predominantly at home uh, with the uh, their care recipient and so they're saying you know people are finally starting to recognize what that experience is like for us so what to be on the lookout um i would say caregivers should really be on the lookout for feelings of burnout or feelings of overload where things are just kind of building on top of each other in terms of responsibilities and stress um, also sometimes if anger starts to come out in caregiving or feelings of helplessness those are things that I would be on the lookout for that might you know, represent a need for additional support um, for the caregiver in terms of their own mental health and then within the care situation um, themselves. And so this is where I think delegation really comes into play for caregivers. Um, that can be really difficult to ask for help. I, caregivers universally struggle to ask their friends and family for additional support, but that can be so important. I think a quote I always use with my caregivers is you can't pour from an empty cup. And so if you're experiencing burnout and stress or mental health symptoms, then your ability to provide care for someone else um, is not as strong. So you have to be taking care of yourself. So when some of those things um, start, uh, some of those symptoms start to be experienced, I would say to caregivers, it's really important to reach out um, and get professional help if, if needed or additional support from friends and family. But with the, with the positive, again, I think 
think one of the things that my caregivers have been telling me is, you know, grocery delivery services have boomed throughout the pandemic. And I think many people were unfamiliar or uncomfortable with using them. And those sorts of things have been so helpful for caregivers. Um, and uh, some of those services offer free delivery for um, older adults. And so something to, to keep in mind, simple things like that, that can take a task off of your plate and free up some time for self-care can be really important. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Leggett, but highlighting both sides of this. Um, the next question, all of you have a special interest in issues related to behavior changes and mood changes that can happen in people with dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Maust, I'll start with you. Are mental health changes always part of dementia and can they be an early sign of dementia? And as dementia progresses, what can be done to address some of these behaviors and mental health changes? So that's a great question. Um, normally when we talk about dementia, people think about a memory change, and that absolutely is part of, uh, part of what dementia is. Um, but there are a whole host of other um, uh, symptoms that can go along. So we oftentimes call them the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. This could include things like depression or apathy or anxiety, um, changes to your sleep cycle, um, all kinds of changes in the way um, you might experience the world, uh, but it's not specifically memory. These symptoms are incredibly common. I, I, I wouldn't say 100% of people with dementia experience them, experience them, but it's pretty close to 100 at some point over the course of illness. Um, they, there's been some evidence that you can start to see subtle evidence of these symptoms before somebody is diagnosed with dementia or has enough memory impairment to be diagnosed with dementia. However, at this point, we're not really making a diagnosis based on these kinds of symptoms. Um, so it's generally more like once somebody has a diagnosis of dementia and then they have some of these other accompanying symptoms that, that go along. Um, there, there are lots of things uh, that can be done to address the symptoms. Um, first and foremost is, is addressing whether there's any sort of like a, a actual medical problem underlying um, that is, you could imagine a person who has dementia might have difficulty articulating or explaining if they're having an ache or a pain, uh, their brain might have a hard time interpreting that. And then like actually finding the language and the words to describe it and to pinpoint the location. Um, and so usually the first step of addressing the symptoms is um, to really help describe what they are and then to think whether there might be something medically that's going on that might be underlying them. Um, I, I just said a lot though, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Gerlach or Leggett to see if they wanna add anything. Yeah, that's great. And maybe I'll just pick up a little bit on what you were mentioning. So I think what Dr. Moss was saying about kind of as patients with dementia kind of progress in the illness, they may lose that ability to kind of communicate their needs verbally. And so I always tell caregivers and care partners that these behaviors are often a type of communication. And it can really take a trial and error approach to understand what these types of behaviors are communicating. So is this an unmet need? You know, is there understimulation in the environment? Environment. Do they have an infection like Dr. Uh, Mosk was saying, you know, is there a way that kind of the communication between the care partner, caregiver and patient could be improved? Um, and so as geriatric psychiatrists, we really try to think about what are the patient kind of the environmental as well as the caregiver factors that might be underlying and contributing to some of these behaviors. And we often will then come up with an individualized treatment plan specific to the patient with dementia and their care partner to help address these behaviors. And this can sometimes include a combination of medications, but more often first different behavioral interventions that we can try um, to try to reduce those behaviors and help both the patient and their care partner. And I can jump in and kind of add from the caregiver's perspective, kind of as Dr. Moss was saying, we tend to think of dementia based on cognitive symptoms. 
However, from the caregiver's perspective, it's really these behavioral and psychological symptoms that they find most stressful. So in some work that I've done, just we ask caregivers open-ended questions about challenging um, parts of caregiving that they had been experiencing recently and have, have them describe for us those challenges and kind of how they responded. And over 50% of the caregivers in, in my study reported some behavioral or psychological symptom that they were finding stressful recently, as opposed to, I think about 20% actually mentioned a cognitive symptom as what was most challenging for them recently. So these are difficult for caregivers, but as, as Dr. Gerlach was saying, there are a number of interventions that incorporate caregivers in the process and in trying to understand what are the antecedents and then and um, what are different solutions that the caregivers may try to also help in addressing some of these symptoms as well. And even things like support groups where caregivers can support one another and brainstorming um, different solutions or approach, uh, approaches to these symptoms can be really helpful as well. Yes, thank you all three for those answers there. The next question that we have coming up, in recent decades, a lot of new medications or new forms of existing medications have come on the market for mental health concerns. And we see a lot of them advertised on TV, in magazines, on the internet. Has this overall been a good thing for reducing stigma and getting people to seek treatment? That's open to, oh, go for it. Yeah, um, I think I have mixed feelings uh, specifically about marketing and advertising for medications. Um, so it, um, if, if by seeing it out there, um, it does help reduce stigma. You know, say if you're sitting there, you're seeing a TV commercial coming on and you say, oh, wow, there must be a lot of other people with this condition if it's worth them advertising it on TV. If that helps somebody feel more comfortable um, about their own condition and feel like it's less stigmatized, I, I absolutely think that that's a good thing. Um, uh, do I think it's a great thing um, for people to be considering medications based on advertisements that they're seeing as opposed to medications coming up in the course of a conversation with their clinician, uh, their physician, their nurse practitioner, that I'm a little bit more on the fence about whether I think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I would say my feelings are the same. So I think it's good and it's important for us, uh, you know, to see ourselves and the commercials and the things that we see. And so if that kind of helps stimulate a discussion between a patient and a, and a physician, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and I think there needs to be more recognition that many people struggle with mental health concerns and that there are treatments out there. I think as Dr. Most was saying, you know, these medications aren't always a panacea. And so important to bring up any concerns that you're having uh, with your doctor and talk about which medication may be best for you. Thank you so much. Next question that we have up, this is an audience question. If a woman has had a mental health diagnosis since their teen or young adult years, such as bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, etc., and now she is approaching or in menopause, what should she be expecting? Will medications not work the same? that's open to any of you three. I guess I can uh, start. So that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, what I would say is that I don't know that there's any great evidence that medications are less effective as we get older or experience life changes like menopause. What I would tell maybe the person asking that question is just to be aware of their mental health, to understand that menopause might be a stressful time, that we're having hormonal changes that might disrupt our sleep patterns, our emotions, kind of the ways that we manage stress and just being aware of that. Um, if you are noticing changes kind of in the symptoms that you experience related to the bipolar disorder, talking with your mental health professional about that, and then really shoring up those extra supports about things that help keep you well. So whether that's kind of exercise, whether that's routine, whether that's kind of, you know, staying in contact with friends and families, making sure that you're still keeping up with those things, even during stressful times. Thank you for that, Dr. Gerlach. Uh, next question. A lot of older adults say they have insomnia or other sleep issues. What's the connection between sleep and mental health as we age? Is it a chicken and egg situation? 
I can jump in a little bit here. Yeah, yeah I think that's a kind of good way, as, as a simple way to explain it, because research has shown now um, for a while that there is some bi-directional associations there, suggesting that um, insomnia or poor sleep can, um, you know, impact a depressive symptoms. And likewise, uh, a symptom of depression is also um, insomnia or poor sleep. So it is somewhat cyclical. Um, a change in one can impact uh, a change in the other. And I think, you know, sleep is a, is a great way to um, potentially have a positive impact on mental health by improving sleep patterns. So there's pretty standard things um, that we call sleep hygiene that are important to getting a good sleep schedule or, or routine um, and making sure we have our internal uh, clock or circ circadian rhythms um, kind of consistent. And so, you know, that that's things like using the bedroom for sleep um, and making sure that we, we dim the lights close to bed, getting our um, phones or our iPads or our computers um, away from us. I know that's really challenging at least 30 minutes before going to bed like a cooler temperature, these sorts of um, sleep hygiene um, facets as well. Some individuals can benefit from um, light therapy. Some individuals um, may have, have medication that can help um, with both. But I think one thing I always like to mention for my older adults is that over-the-counter sleep medications are incredibly common. And I think many older adults will take sleep challenges into their own hands, whether it be like a Z-Quil or something that you can find just over-the-counter. Uh, but these are really concerns to be uh, talking about with, with your doctor because there are a, a number of these over-the-counter medications that have some important side effects that can um, you know, impact things like falls um, at night or other things that could be potentially harmful for older adults. And so um, if we are seeing sleep concerns and, and mental health concerns, these are really, I would say, conversations to be having with your primary care doctor um, or, or other physician um, to make sure that we're getting both of these things in check because they do really, um, I, I, they do really relate to one another. I'll, I'll just tag on to what Dr. Leggett said to say, uh, I think it is important to appreciate um, that's there can be changes in, in what is normal sleep with age. Um, so the total number of hours actually does go down a little bit. The amount of time that you spend in sort of the most restful type of sleep is actually reduced. And so I, I do think um, uh, people might slightly adjust their expectations for a, a good normal night of sleep uh, when you're 65 or 70 um, we know, frankly, should look a little bit different than when you were maybe 45 or 50. That's just the way the body and the brain ages. Um, the one other thing I'll just tag on to what Dr. Leggett said about over-the-counter sleep, um, sleep medications is, is sometimes the, you know, the, the, the intervention to get a good night of sleep or what you perceive to be a good night of sleep actually can end up putting you at greater risk. Um, than having a night of not great sleep. And in particular, things like Tylenol PM, which I had to have my mom take out of the medicine, my parents' medicine cabinet at home. All it is, is acetaminophen or Tylenol plus diphenhydramine or Benadryl. So Benadryl is a very, what we call it's an anticholinergic medication. It can dry your mouth out. It can make it constipated. In particular for older adults, it can actually dull your cognition and your thinking. And we know in the long run, uh, for people who have a lot of exposure to Benadryl, say like over decades, um, it actually seems to increase your risk of dementia, which is pretty scary. Um, so you just really need to be very wary of over-the-counter sleep aids. Um, and so just echoing what Dr. Leggett said, make, make sure you do talk to your doctor before you're taking something. Thank you for that, Some, Dr. Moss. I think that also comes up with some older adults is it can be common to take a nap, a nap during the day. And we don't often think about how that then may impact our nighttime sleep schedule. So just something else to throw in there. If, if you're a napper, then it, it may be that it's harder for you to fall asleep at night and, and things like that, uh, because that is kind of impacting those daily rhythms. 
Thank you. Thank you for all of these answers. The, the next question that we have up uh, is around the other issue that a lot of our older adults deal with, which is chronic pain, whether it's from arthritis or another condition. Can you talk about how mental health intersects with pain and how treatment for one can perhaps affect the other? I think it's a similar discussion as with sleep, um, that chronic pain can be a risk factor for mental health conditions and mental health conditions can make chronic pain worse. And so I kind of use the example that, you know, if on a typical day I stub my toe, no big deal. If I'm already having a bad day and then I stub my toe, it's a lot bigger of a deal. And so the way that we perceive pain can actually be amplified in the setting of depression, anxiety, other mental health conditions. So I think it's really important to make sure that you're treating both, um, that you're addressing both the chronic pain as well as the mental health uh, concern. And sometimes the medications and therapies that we think about specifically Specifically, target both of those conditions for older adults. Thank you for that, Dr. Gerlach. Um, older people with sleep issues, pain, depression, and anxiety may get prescriptions for medications to treat these conditions or buy over the counter products and supplements to try and get relief. When do you start worrying about how these drugs interact with one another? And can some of those interactions be dangerous? What might happen? And that obviously actually goes back. To, to Dr. Most, what you, you touched on a couple of questions ago. So um, I guess the, the reality is that all medications, even including over-the-counter medications, potentially have side effects. Um, the more medications you're on, the more potential side effects that you can experience. Also, the more potential there is that the, that the medications aren't playing nicely together. So they can influence how your body processes or clears the medication. Uh, some medications um, reduce the, 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 the way that your body clears it, meaning you, your body actually is seeing a lot more of the medication. Other medications can promote how your body clears it, meaning it's cleared out of your system a lot more quickly. So you have to be mindful, not only of the side effects of the medication, but how it interacts with the other medications that you're on. And then finally, um, uh, part of the side effects of medications can be related to other medical conditions that you have. Um, and so again, as folks age, we know that, um, uh, medical conditions can um, sort of accumulate with age. So um, then you're more at risk potentially for side effects of the medications that you're on in a way that maybe you wouldn't have been if you were taking that medication when you were a 30 year old. So I really think of it as a um, sort of a process of accumulation and potential risks sort of on multiple different fronts. And so the, the main advice is just medications are incredibly important uh, and we're really lucky to have all of the incredible medications that we have. You just want to understand what you're on and why you're on it. And then does it make sense with everything else that's going on uh, with your health? Um, I'll see if my colleagues have more to add. You know, we have, uh, oh, Dr. Gerlach, I saw you unmuted, go for it. Uh, I was really just going to follow up about what older adults might do about that. So if they're worried about the number of medications they're taking, or maybe a family member is worried about the number of medications, you know, what I recommend is when you go to see your primary care doctor or nurse practitioner to really bring in all of the medications that you're taking. And that includes over-the-counter medications and supplements. So I think folks will sometimes just bring in the prescribed medications, but it's really important to bring in anything that you're taking, either in a list or just bring the bottles. Um, and that way your physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant can really review the medications, look for potential interactions and alert you if there's anything that they're concerned about and kind of help you try to pare down that medication list um, if possible. Yeah, thank you. That's a really important reminder there. Um, the, the next topic, we can't have a discussion about older adults and mental health without talking about a topic that's very distressing, but very real, and that's suicide. So for our audience who are listening right now, if this topic might be distressing for some of you, you may want to 
silence your volume for the next few minutes. If you're listening to a recording, um, you can uh, fast forward. You can always step away and return. This recording will be on our social media platforms, especially YouTube afterwards as well, if you're watching live. But we will move into uh, the topic of suicide. And the first question we have is we hear a, a lot about suicide risks among young people, but not as often about the fact that 18% of suicides are in people over age 65. And the single group of Americans with the highest risk of suicide is men over 65. Can you talk about some of the risk factors and warning signs for suicide in older adults? So I think we've actually already talked about a number of these potential risk factors. So we know that pain is a big risk factor for suicide. Uh, we know that insomnia is a big risk factor. We know that social isolation is a risk factor. Um, we know that medical illness is a risk factor. And so uh, in some ways, um, th those are, many of those things are things that accumulate with age. Um, in particular, so older men, if you think about a man in his 80s um, who possibly is not working full time anymore, so the way that he really identified himself and valued his life, particularly for the current cohort of 80 year old men, probably was largely through work. So they don't have that role in their lives anymore. They might have experienced a, a period of illness. Um, and then if you add in pain, uh, insomnia, well, lots of risk factors into the mix, it, it, is, uh, it is a population of high risk. It is something that I definitely talk about with the learners that we work with, uh, because I, I don't think people really appreciate um, that this particular demographic group, white men in their 80s, really is at very high risk. Um, the... The, the trick is that suicide is oftentimes a very impulsive act. Um, uh, that's why gun safety, firearm safety is actually one of the most important things you could do. So if you're concerned about say your, your father or, or really anyone in your life, um, we know that there are lots of folks, there are many firearms around us, many firearm owners, many patients we work with. I work at the VA, many veterans who are firearm owners. So what I would encourage, particularly for older adults, is when you, you think about having a uh, living will, advanced care planning, sort of planning what to do with your assets, um, you shouldn't be including firearms in that. You should be planning what to do. You should be asking your parents if they have firearms, where they're stored, if they're stored safely, what they want done with them, um, should something happen to them. When do you make the decision about maybe when it needs to be passed on to another member in the family? Um, so, so really being mindful about it and planning about it um, is is. Um, part of the way to really think about risk, to try to reduce risk in, in your family. Thank you. I think that was a really important answer. The, the next question ties into this. I, I think you touched on this heavily. If someone is concerned about suicide risk in an older person they love, what are some of the things they can do? Yeah, so I, I might first uh, recommend checking in with the person. It can be uncomfortable to have these conversations and sometimes distressing, but if there are things you're noticing, so the person is isolating more, they appear to be more uh, depressed and withdrawn, um, they're kind of changing their normal kind of routine of behavior, or they're not taking care of themselves, or they're expressing that they're suicidal or wish that they weren't around. You know, it's important to ask about these things. I know it can be uncomfortable and feel scary to do so, but check checking in with that person and expressing your concern, um, seeing how they're doing, um, you know, encouraging them to talk to someone about it outside of the family. So whether it's their mental health professional, talking with their primary care doctor, you know, reaching out to get some help. Um, of course, you know, asking about firearms in the home, other lethal means, kind of excess kind of medications, you know, just trying to check in about that. And then if there's imminent concern or real safety concern that you have, you know, calling 911 
911 and bringing someone to the emergency department. I think as part of this, they'll be sharing some of the numbers for the National Suicide Hotline that are available. You know, these are resources that are available 24 seven. And so there are, um, you know, resources available at any time if someone has kind of imminent concern. And that moves us on to our next question. If someone has been thinking about suicide or even making a plan to attempt suicide or someone suspects or knows that someone they love may be suicidal, um, who, uh, what, what are the areas that we may want to, to mention? I think you mentioned the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Yeah, so I think the, the number you've possibly heard in the news, it's... it's um, it's actually the same line for both veterans and, and for others in the community. It's 1-800-273-8255, uh, which is also uh, 1-800-273-TALK-8255. Um, uh, and so um, that uh, would be a place where you could potentially be connected to other resources. But again, as Dr. Gerlach mentioned, if it really is feeling like an imminent moment of crisis, 911 uh, would probably be the, the, the best option to, to go to if, if you're concerned that even calling a helpline um, might not quite be uh, what you need at the moment. Thank you. And, and those will be put in our chats too, so people can see those numbers as well. Um, there was mention was, of 911. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to add, we also have... Um, you know, a veterans crisis line as well. So I, I think we have the same number, but um, you can also visit www.veteranscrisisline.net. Perfect. And those are, those are all very important numbers and we'll, we'll be putting those in the websites down. There was mention of 911 and this summer a 911 system just for mental health emergencies is going to launch. Are you hopeful that this will help? I think it's great provided that there are actually resources there to connect people to. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest concerns and challenges with mental health access is th there might be many resources and clinicians out there, even if there are though, um, they, it doesn't help if there's a months long wait list. Um, so I think that that's, I, I'm excited. Um, that there will be a mental health emergency line. My only concern and worry is that there are really enough resources out there to connect people to who, who need help. Especially during COVID, that's been a challenge too. Yeah, absolutely. We, the next question that we have in is an audience question. I know we spoke about the impact of the pandemic before, but a member of our audience has commented on something that I hope you can address. Many older people have been very cautious for the past two years about avoiding COVID. Now they're being encouraged to re-enter society and get back to normal, and that may be causing anxiety for some of them. Can you comment on ways they could overcome some of that worry, especially if they've been vaccinated and boosted? Maybe start, maybe getting back to any routine. You know, I think it can be overwhelming for many of us to be like, uh, to finally kind of get back into those kind of social situations. And I would say just take it at a pace that feels comfortable for you. So kind of any kind of connections outside of the home with friends, kind of loved ones, uh, kind of family, you know, taking it at a pace that feels comfortable for you. Fortunately, we're getting at a time of year where the weather's getting nicer, that allows for more outdoor gatherings, you you know, at a distance that might feel more comfortable than doing something inside. And so I would just say, you know, keep a, keep a look at the local numbers where you are. Don't feel pressured to do anything that you're not comfortable with. And, you know, start slow and kind of gradually build up these activities as you feel comfortable. Um, and I think sharing that kind of apprehension or anxiety with people is completely understandable and might help them understand where you're coming from and kind of still find ways to connect that still feel comfortable to you. Yeah, and I would just add, um, 
That's an excellent question. And I, I just really want to normalize that. Just thinking about conversations in my own family over the weekend, um, we're all exhausted after dealing with this pandemic for over two years now. Um, and it really, I think, is a individual person by person, family by family decision and discussion. And it's tiring to make. Um, I think many people are having these sorts of mental calculations that they're making. Um, one thing that sort of helps me personally is thinking about trying to put sort of COVID risk in context of other types of risk in life. So we all get flu shots every year, but it doesn't perfectly protect us from flu. So every year there's always some risk of getting flu. My children have had risk of getting flu. My parents have had risk of getting flu. And so that's part of how I personally help help think through and make the decision. But again, just thank you for the question and 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 normalizing that 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 is something that that uh, we're we're all struggling with. And uh, if another audience member has a has a good answer, please put it in the chat because I'd like to see it. Yes, please. Me too. Um, the next question we have up. Um, we know we have a massive shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health providers in this country. So primary care is where a lot of people first voice their mental health concerns and get treatment. What's a good way for an older adult to start the conversation with their primary care doctor or nurse practitioner about their mental state? If you've found a therapist on your own and are seeing them regularly, should you tell your primary care doctor? Sure, so I can start. You know, I would say just be honest about how you're feeling and you may not even be really sure what's going on and just kind of explaining the symptoms or kind of changes that you've noticed. Is it changes in your sleep? Is it that you're just finding you're not enjoying things as much as you used to? Are you feeling overly worried and stressed? Um, is it hard to kind of relax or feel calm? You know, just describing whatever it is. You know, do you feel like your stomach's in knots? You're having more pain? You know, whatever it is, just kind of um, uh, explaining that to your provider so that they can help. Um, sometimes I'll tell people if they feel uncomfortable bringing up these concerns, bring someone with you to the appointment, whether it's a spouse, a friend, another family member, or someone who's close to you who might be able to help communicate some of those things that they've noticed. Sometimes people outside of us notice things even before we do. And so that person might be able to help explain some of the concerns that they've had or help you to communicate some of those, um, some of those concerns to your providers. And I would just add that realistically, primary care providers are, are the primary providers of mental health care in the country because there are so few mental health providers that it really is primary care. So if they haven't heard it from you, I promise you they've heard it from many of their other patients. And so they absolutely would want to hear from you. Um, if you are seeing a therapist, I am a big fan of having all of the all of the clinicians, all of the cooks in the kitchen, knowing who else is involved in care. So I would absolutely encourage you to let your, your clinician know um, if you are seeing a therapist and, and then maybe it's just an FYI versus you actually want your clinician to talk to the therapist, maybe being um, explicit about that um, with your clinician, but I, I would definitely encourage you to share that information. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Another audience question for you. Can you comment on cannabis use to ease mental health concerns in older adults? So I guess I would say that there's not great data out there to support its benefit. Certainly, I know plenty of people use it. Um, I would give my sort of standard caution with really any type of psychoactive substance um, to just be careful to not drive under the influence, uh, to be careful about mixing it with other types of substances, either other medications that might be sedating, um, alcohol use. Um, again, I this would be something where I would say to let your clinician know uh, so they can maybe help have a conversation with you. Um, but I, I think that the truest answer is there's not really a lot of 
great, high quality data, either pro or con uh, cannabis use, particularly in older adults. Maybe the only other thing I would add to that, that there are some side effects with uh, cannabis or marijuana use that you'd want to be particularly kind of aware of as you get older. And so one is that for older adults who might already be experiencing some changes in terms of their memory, thinking, or concentration, sometimes marijuana can make that worse. For folks who are experiencing some difficulty with motivation or apathy or kind of difficulty with drive or initiative to do things, marijuana can sometimes make that worse. Same with anxiety kind of panic type symptoms. And so really just being aware of kind of what some of the side effects are and kind of putting that into your own calculation when thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have up, the pandemic has made it very clear that a lot of mental health care can be delivered over telemedicine video connections, or even the phone or text or chat within a patient portal system. There's also been a rise in apps for mood monitoring and management, which don't even involve a live interaction with another human. Do you think the advent of all this technology for mental health is a good thing, or do you perhaps have concerns? Um, I, I'll, I'll start. So I think in the I think greater availability of virtual visits is probably a good thing, um, particularly if you maybe have some sort of physical difficulty, mobility difficulty, making your appointments. Um, there are some types of visits, particularly say mental health visits where a physical exam is less necessary, um, where I think telemedicine is a good thing, provided patients can actually have access to it and have the resources to, to make those visits happen. Um, I think on that, uh, um, the app front, I think maybe the jury is out on the benefit there. I personally am maybe a little bit skeptical about apps that don't have engagement with another human, because in general, I think what we know about sort of mental health care in general, psychotherapy in particular, as part of it really is about the relationship that you develop with the clinician. And so maybe in a couple of years we'll be there with artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm skeptical that we're there yet. And it's really easy for apps to be created. So I would just also put in the warning that it's important to do maybe your research into an app if you're looking into that to make sure that um, these different treatments or programs um, are empirically based and there's, there's been research done on them um, because it, it, there could be things out there that are really not beneficial. There's so much out there. So yeah, again, maybe something to talk about with the primary care physician um, as well. And then I just wanted to say something um, related to the telesupports from the caregiver perspective. Um, my caregivers have really benefited from virtual support groups, um, especially because sometimes um, we, we know Alzheimer's disease, for example, is really common and everyone has heard of it, but there are other types of dementia that are a little bit less common, like a frontotemporal dementia or a Lewy body or a vascular. And one of the amazing things about the virtual supports that have popped up over the last two years is you can find a, a support group literally anywhere in the United States that you could join that's going to have some of those commonalities. And so my caregivers have told me, you know, they've benefited from words of wisdom from people in Florida and California, et cetera, that they otherwise wouldn't have had access to um, because they're able to join these virtual support groups. So if there's a type of support group that would be most beneficial for you, but is maybe not available in your community, if you live in a rural area or you're, you're dealing with um, a concern that's maybe more unique, um, I would encourage my caregivers to look and see whether virtual programming um, of the support group type of, of nature might be accessible to you. Thank you for that. And you know, you know, we have completed an hour of this chat right now, and I wanna be super respectful of your time but I would love uh, for some final thoughts or if you think there's anything we have perhaps missed before I move on to give uh, more useful links and, and uh, phone numbers for support. 
I think we covered a lot of ground. Thank you for the audience questions. Thank you for your ex excellent moderation. Uh, and I, I, nothing else comes to the top of my head. I think there will be a link um, in the chat for a number of events we have coming up um, within psychiatry and within Michigan medicine that may be relevant um, for those who are listening in today. So just keep an eye out on that. Um, thankfully, with Michigan medicine, we have tons of resources related to all of the topics we've discussed today. So reach out and um, yeah, don't be afraid to, to reach out and get support. Thank you, Dr. Gerlach. Anything to add? No, likewise, we appreciate the platform to be able to talk today and glad that there's better recognition, as we've said, about mental health as a core kind of pillar of overall health. And so if folks are experiencing some of the symptoms or things that we talked about today or have concern for a loved one who might be experiencing these symptoms, please don't hesitate to bring it up with your healthcare provider. Perfect. Well, thank you all three. And thank you to everyone for joining us today as we mark Mental Health Awareness Month. If you'd like to share this video with anyone, you'll be able to find it on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and Facebook page at any time. You can see other upcoming live streams at medicine.umich.edu slash DEPT slash psychiatry slash events. That was a bit of a mouthful, so I'll repeat that. medicine.umich.edu slash DEPT slash psychiatry slash events. If you or someone you know needs immediate mental health crisis support, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's 800-273-8255. 800-273-8255. Or use the chat function on their website at suicidepreventionlifeline.org slash chat. We really appreciate our experts' help today with today's chat. So thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. And we hope you all have a good week. Thank you.